Hi, my name is Alex Cassano, and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today we will be having Laura Kempner. She will be speaking about the history of Safety Harbor, so I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you. I am Laura Kepner, and I live in Safety Harbor, and I recognize several of you here. Thank you for coming. Um, this is our beautiful little museum. Uh, it's not as little as it used to be, but when I first came to Safety Harbor with my husband, we came from Washington State and traveled all the way down to Florida. Now, he grew up on the Gulf Coast, but I, was, I got here and I was taking pictures of egrets, and grasshoppers, I just couldn't get over it. But we found Safety Harbor and just knew it was, I hear that from a lot of people, they just felt like it was home. Um, so my son visited, he's in Texas, he's a high school history teacher, and he said, let's go to the museum. That's what we do when we get together, we go to museums. So we went in and I realized that this little five square mile radius town is chock full of history as is Clearwater. I mean, we just have so much that happened here. A lot, of, a lot of wonderful, tough people were the first to arrive, and, uh, and they held on. But our museum, at the time, we looked for a history book. And they said, I think it was Scott who said, there hasn't been one written yet. So um, I thought, how cool that would be. Uh, I, I'm a writer, but I'm not a historian. Um, I, I don't have that history, so I love it, but I don't have training in it. So anyway, um, the history that I did learn about our town was from local people and signs. This one is at the Safety Harbor Resort and Spa. Do any of you live in Safety Harbor? Okay, great. And are any of you familiar with Safety Harbor? I mean, have you been there if you don't live there? Okay. So the spa, as you may know, is right there on the waterfront. It's, for many years, has been a big attraction for tourism. But this sign here is how I learned that Hernando de Soto discovered Safety Harbor in 1539. This is what it says. On May 18, 1539, Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto reached the shores of what is now Tampa Bay. Landing near these mineral springs used by the native population for nearly 10,000 years. Believing he had found the legendary fountain of youth somehow missed by Ponce de Leon, de Soto established a camp here, naming the crystal clear waters Espiritu Santo Springs, Springs of the Holy Spirit. But I like to call this no Soto. He was not here. Yeah. <laughs> he was not. There's no proof that he made it to Safety Harbor. Um, it was probably something that was made up to attract tourism. Um, as you know, as much as it's an interesting story, uh, there's just no proof of where he landed anywhere. Um, probably uh, uh, at the opening of the Little Manatee River, but we don't know for sure. But we're, it's been ruled out that he did not discover Safety Harbor. But this guy was there, Pedro Menendez. So Menendez, um, another one of my kids, Ariana, who a couple of you know, she came home one day from school and told me about the horrors of this man and what he did. and. She was learning all about uh, the Spanish conquistadors and about the, the Spanish explorers and missionaries. And I remember her talking about him. She was just horrified. But then I learned that he came to Safety Harbor and he was looking for water. Um, he, was, he wanted a waterway to connect the, you know, the, uh, <laughs> I'm losing my uh, train of thought here. He, he wanted to, to just connect the, the, uh, the coasts of the peninsula so that travel would be easier. They, they would um, bring up goods from Mexico, and it was dangerous to travel by sea. Um, now, the tribe at the time that he dealt with were the Calusa, the Calus. The Spanish decided to just call the 
the tribe leader, uh, the chief, Carlos, because that was easier for them. So you may see his name as Carlos, uh, Carlos, a um, couple other things. But uh, Menendez um, talked to him. Now, Carlos asked, he wanted uh, Menendez to marry his sister. So that happened. And then <laughs> um, he still, he wasn't giving up about the, uh, the waterway. And Calus said, hey, I know where it is, but it's in the Tokabaga territory. And the Tokabaga were the enemies of the Calusa. So he, uh, he tricked Menendez and said, I'll give you the location of the waterway, but yeah, you have to marry my sister and you have to kill the Tokabaga. And Menendez said, no, now normally that was his thing. He was pretty... You know, he was uh, pretty rough, and, and he would have devastated the Tokubaga, but that wasn't his plan. He decided to create a peace treaty. Archaeological evidence, as you can see here, says that peop there were indigenous people 12 to 15,000 years ago. And around AD 900, uh, the new culture, the Safety Harbor culture, was formed. Um, that It has been named the Safety Harbor culture because of the archaeological finds. Um, anthropologists named it that. Um, the indigenous people of Safety Harbor, they were the Yusita, the Morosco, Moro, Mor, Mocoso, I'm so sorry, um, and the Pahoy. So there were the, the, the Tokabaga were probably the most powerful indigenous group of the time. Now we also, just let me go back a little bit, if De Soto had been here in 1539, the Tokabaga, they would not have been as strong. That's just logic. They would not have been the powerful people that they were because everywhere that these, the Spanish went, you know what happened. There was, they, they weren't used to the germs, the viruses, and they would have, a lot of them would have died off. So that's, um, but the Tokabaga, now this painting here, Oh, what's his name? He's an artist who lives in St. Augustine. Um, I actually have a print of this. Um, the man that painted them, he's, he's um, oh, does anybody know the Native American painter in St. Augustine? I'll think of it. But we went to his home slash studio in old, the old part of St. Augustine. I mean, it's all old, but uh, he... He's very, we had to go visit him to get permission to use the painting because he wanted to see what we had written about the Tokabaga and to make sure we were historically accurate. So we were a little nervous, but he gave us permission. Um, and this is, he said that they did, they painted their skin red when they wanted to impress people or when they wanted to go to war. Uh, they wore pearls around their necks and wrists. Uh, he said that they were tattooed. One of the Spanish um, um, said that he was going to uh, tattoo himself like the Indians. And so they described how they had tattooed themselves. So that's a pretty accurate uh, view of what they looked like. The mound was, the, the mounds were built, we believe, by the Tokabaga. Um, people say that the mound builders created them. It could have been people before the Tokabaga. But we do know that they used the mounds. They buried their dead. They, um, the chief lived with his family on top of it. It was much bigger than it is now. It's been, a, you know, there's been erosion. Um, but this is just a view from the water side of the mound. All right, and here's this guy. I believe his name is pronounced O'Day because it is a French name. Odette is the female version. But if you go to Safety Harbor, you'll hear everybody saying Odette Philippi, you know. But however you pronounce his name, I, I like to go on to Ancestry. Uh, does anybody in here do that? Do you? Okay, or newspapers.com. I found a, an 1810 census with the name Aude, A-U-D-E-T, same last name. Now census takers would fill out their paperwork 
you know, all the, they would hear the, the name and they would write it down, spell it as best they could. So that's also a reason I believe his name was more French. It, you know, he did say he was born in Lyon, France. Let's see. Whoops. All right. So as far as we know, the story of O'Day is that he was the great nephew of King Louis the Sixteenth. He was a friend of a childhood friend of Napoleon, and Napoleon later assigned him chief surgeon of his navy. Uh, he asked O'Day to be his chief surgeon in the navy um, because O'Day was a doctor. That that too. Um, first of all. We believe that if he had been related to the king, there'd be some record of it, right? I mean, there's so many history books. Well, O'Day got, oops, O'Day, um, he, was, he was very likely, we, we know this from the book that his um, descendant wrote um, that is at the Safety Harbor Library, um, that O'Day was probably not from Lyon, France. He was probably from San Domingue, where Haiti is, and he probably left there as a teenager. He may have been of mixed race, and of course at that time, where he came from, he was very likely wealthy, but let's say he comes to the USA where we have slaves. He's not going to say, He's not going to admit it if he can get away with it. I don't blame him. But that census form I found did say that this man, now it may not be the same man, but that he was black. Now back then you could have been an eighth, anything. If you had one drop, you were considered black. So we don't know how really, um, let me go back, what he looked like. This is just a depiction. But there are a couple letters that describe him of being of dark complexion. But what we do know about O'Day is that he is the king of citrus. Not only did he bring citrus to his plantation, which I forgot to mention, he called it St. Helena, which is also in reference to Napoleon. He built his home on top of the mound in Philippi Park. Um, he had rows and rows of beautiful trees. It became a tourist attraction. Um, but the, only th the other thing that he did was that he shared his knowledge. He knew how to graft these citrus trees. He created the Duncan grapefruit. Um, and he shared the knowledge with his neighbors. Now, he did get his land because of the 1842 Armed Occupation Act. And there were quite a few others around him, but he is, we believe, the only one who stayed in Safety Harbor. It was tough. I mean, we didn't, they didn't have any creature comforts running water. They had to go down to the, to the bay and get their water to the springs. Thankfully, they had that. Um, you know, mosquitoes are bad now, but imagine back then. I, and so, of course, that mound that he lived on probably helped relieve that's probably why the Tocobaga lived there, too. In the evening, when the mosquitoes came out, they were at a higher elevation. Like I said, it was much higher then than it is now. So what we should remember about this man is that he did, he probably was the reason the citrus industry in Florida flourished as it did, because he shared his knowledge. He was said to be a very kind man. Um, he had four daughters. No male descendants directly, um, but there are many, many booths. McMullen Booth Road, the booths are descended from O'Day Philippi. All right. The other thing that he said was that he had a friend who was a pirate named Gomez. And Gomez had given him, he had saved everyone on Gomez's ship and, because they were sick and he was a doctor. So Gomez gave him a trunk of treasure gold. Um, so throughout the years, back in the day when, when everybody believed that he was a count, I didn't tell you he was a count too, um, they would go out to Philippi Park and dig for treasure. 
<laughs> Have you heard that, Bobby? <laughs> so um, they would find arrowheads and pottery, uh, that kind of thing, but no one has yet to find the treasure. So just so you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, don't come dig it. Um, these are the McMullen brothers. I just love this picture. They had sisters too, but the sisters didn't make the cut for the photo. Um, the youngest McMullen brother came here in. He was also quite a, um, a huge help, both in Clearwater, Safety Harbor. Um, he built a school at Sylvan Abbey. Uh, they, were, they were big in the, the um, production of transporting. They created, it was one of the McMullins who created the crates that they shipped the oranges in. I mean, they were just involved from every aspect. And this is, this is from Dunedin, but this is a picture of where you would have lived had you been living back then. You would have lived, if you were fortunate, to have a house. This is about what your house would look like. And I'm sure, it, it, I, I'm just saying, it's, it's pretty typical. Um, there were wealthier people who had bigger homes, but they had to build everything themselves. They... They had to build their own homes. They didn't have tools, especially not power tools. They didn't exist. But they had to um, build their own furniture, wear their own, uh, make their own clothing from whatever they had. Um, so we have the settlers, and we, um, we went through that. But it was around... Let's skip to late 1800s, around 1880 to 1900. Um, there were people who came to Safety Harbor for the water. Now this water had already had a reputation for being healing. Um, but the Baileys and the Tuckers, this was Mr. Bailey, who bought the property. He owned the springs and he started advertising. So this pamphlet, um, let me see if I can, it says, These famous springs boast, the be boast of being the original fountain of perpetual youth, sought by Ponce de Leon and discovered by Hernando de Soto in May 1539. I have to admit that I did not know that the Ponce de Leon story was fiction until I was an adult. I had learned that story through my childhood. Um, it, was, it was not even spoken about until 14 years or so after Ponce de Leon passed away. And apparently he was a very vain man. So there was someone back in Spain who made a joke about his vanity because some of his, you know, he wasn't successful in finding a waterway um, either. And so they started teasing him that he was actually looking for the Fountain of Youth. And today, if you look on the internet for Ponce de Leon, you, before you find the truth, you're going to go through article after article about this Fountain of Youth. Okay. This was a building. I just love this picture. This is a building um, around the turn of the century, probably. It was, we had a big fire in 1917, and it was before that. But... Um, I'm sure Clearwater had a lot of the same style buildings. They were wood. It was very, very easy for these structures to catch fire, and they did. Um, Laura? Yes. What do you think W-O-W stands for? It was the Woodman, let me think, Wood of the World. Wood, 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 it was a sorority, not a sorority, a fraternity. Fraternity? Yeah. Um, Woodmen of the world? Something like that. But they were like the lions or the um, back then. So I, I Scott helped me. The so the springs, the springs, of course, were the were the attraction to Safety Harbor. Um, this, there's probably, I think there's a building about this high there now, and. It's hard, to, it's hard to tell, but exactly where that is. Do you know where that is, Bobby? But, you know, they, they, they said that it cured the kidneys. It cured uh, everything you can think of, heart problems, rheumatism, everything that people were suffering at the time. What do I have next? 
So the water, um, I remember there was a man named Ernst at um, Heritage Village. He was a volunteer, and I don't know if he's still there, Ernst Duffmeyer. He told me a story that he, when he was a kid, his dad would travel from Tampa, and he would have these huge glass water jugs in the back of their truck. And they would, they would go to Safety Harbor to get all these jugs filled up because they also believed that it helped, healed. And Ernst said, you know, we don't know if it didn't. Maybe it did help us. But you gotta think, how clean was their water back then? So they have this natural spring water that had minerals in it, things that probably the normal <coughs> average American didn't get unless they were somehow getting it through their food or water. But then we had the Florida land boom um, in the 20s, and this building is now the Safety Harbor Senior Living Building, but it was connected to the spa. It was the St. James Hotel. James Tucker was in the Confederacy. He was a Confederate soldier, and he was married to Virginia Tucker, and she adored him because after he died, she named this the St. James Hotel. So we can tell she adored him. Um, at least that's my opinion. I, I love my husband, but he's not a saint. <laughs> so anyway, he, uh, this, this building is just something that's really neat because this is typically what the buildings looked like in the Florida land boom. This hotel had the first telephones in Pinellas County in every room, hot running water in every room. So it was really something. But then, as you may know already, the Florida land boom, it didn't last. And there were some very difficult times leading up to, of course, the Great Depression. And then we had Mr. Salem Baranoff. He came to Safety Harbor. Um, later, I have a picture of the Baranoff Oak in front of our library. It's such a beautiful tree. But Baranoff, uh, Re revamped the spa. He had people coming, very well-to-do people coming from New York, and they would stay for months. Um, they would come for their health. A lot of them were trying to, to um, become sober. A lot of them were trying to lose weight. He had a plan, and it was grapefruit every day, no salt. I mean, it was a very strict diet. And I've heard that, that people would sneak out at night and go across the street to a little store and buy potato chips. <laughs> but later it became just a place to get away, a vacation home. A lot of Jewish people stayed there. He was Jewish, but they stayed there and they would take morning walks. And people who lived in, the, lived in Safety Harbor in the 50s that I interviewed, 40s, 50s, they say that it was really a sight because every morning he would lead all of his his hotel stay, you know, his his uh, customers on this walk along the bay. Um, some people like that. Now, this is also I should have put this back a little. This is one of the um, the water bottle labels um, claiming, um, of course, it says Hernando de Soto discovered it. And the springs are designed to become one of the country's greatest res Oh, these springs are destined to become one of the country's greatest resorts for those in quest of health and recreation. So. You notice that they disclaimer at the bottom of Oh, what, what was the disclaimer? Even back then, they had the disclaimer. For best results from the use of spiritual water, a competent physician should be <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh yeah. That's cute. Don't sue us. <laughs> so I love the stories of the train. Um, I think Clearwater had a train before Safety Harbor. Our train came in. The, now, tracks were laid throughout Pinellas County in... I could be wrong on this, I believe it was the mid-1800s, but there weren't many trains for those tracks uh, until a little later. But Safety Harbor didn't have anything 
that connected them to Clearwater or Tampa until 1914. So this little um, station was near the railroad tracks right downtown. If any of you know downtown Safety Harbor, mm -hmm. um, the American Legion is across from Whistle Stop, mm -hmm. and this was located near the American Legion, right on the tracks, so right near the tracks. So I'll give you an idea. Um, one story that I came across in an old uh, newspaper, St. Pete Times or something, um, was that when the conductor would come through town, there were hogs everywhere. Does Clearwater have that history too? I believe you do. Um, wild hogs came because the Spanish brought them for food and they ended up letting them just eat and roam. Well, they became overwhelming. And until recently, maybe they still are in some areas, but um, they, they brought them for food and the hogs flourished. So there was a wild pig that they called, um, I think they called her Priscilla, I don't remember, but she would bring her little babies every day across the tracks and the conductor would stop so that she could cross the tracks. And I just thought that was, that was so Safety Harbor. I mean, even back then, you know, it just very sweet. This is Mr. William Blackshear over here on and he was with George McGonigal, who has just recently passed away. He was a mayor. Mr. Blackshear ran for city commission, and he won. And he, um, he was the first African-American man to hold office in Florida. Um, and this, he was only about 28, I believe. Do you all know who um, the actor in Look Who's Come? His, what is his name? Zane. Zane. Yes, yes, that's how he speaks. And he calls me once in a while still, and he is the most, I can see why people loved him as their commissioner. He just listens, and he's, he's so soft-spoken and so intelligent, and you just love having a conversation with him. He always has time for a conversation. So we loved interviewing him, and he had nothing bad to say about the relations the, the, between the cultures, black and white. He said he didn't have any bad experiences. Now, I don't know if, that, if he's just remembering fondly, but um, he was very proud to be known because Lyndon Johnson called him to the White House with about, I believe, 30 other African-American people from the South, and um, it's just not been made a big enough deal, I think. So we really wanted to include in the book, uh, we have chapter 13, which is just specifically African American history, because as with even all of us, if we don't write our histories down, they're not going to be remembered. So it's very important. Right now, I've told kids that I work with, you should keep a diary because you are living through a time in history that will be remembered who knows how. I mean, look at what we've been through this past year. We're resilient. You know, this mask wearing, no traveling, uh, no hugging our grandkids. That's, um, that's been difficult. So the people that remember this year and a half that we've just dealt with all this, they're going to remember it from the news reels, the, the, the things that they can watch that came from CNN or Fox News or MSNBC. And they're, they're not going to know their grandma or grandpa's or aunt or uncle's story unless we tell it to them or write it down. So I'm always trying to advocate you writing your story. Laura? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you mind if I ask questions? Is that oh, okay? Yeah. I was going to do a question at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah, please do. Please do. Oh, what date was that prior picture? I'm really oh. bad at remembering dates. It was, it was okay. like 19... It was definitely the 60s, um, after after segregation ended. Um, so it was after. I have the, the books. I can look 60, it up. 65 after the voters' rights. I guess. I think it was actually a little later than later that. Later than that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I'll research too. I don't yeah. know myself. Yeah, I I actually have it here, but I just. 
So I did orange. I don't. I don't. Um, I don't hold dates anymore. I don't know what that's know. about. But <laughs> yeah, okay. my yeah. husband will say, "What's in the bank account?" I don't. I don't hold numbers. You... <laughs> anyway. Okay, so I just love this picture. Um, I just wanted to say that Safety Harbor, whoever we interviewed, still to this day, there are a couple Facebook pages um, dedicated to people who grew up in Safety Harbor. They just have these nostalgic, wonderful memories. Um, the kids, you know, fished at the pier, they rode their bikes, they would sneak a tomato af af out of Mr. Thompson's yard, and, you know, they never went home all day when the streets were dark, they went home. But that's how it was for a lot of us. But they had the bay, and they would uh, swim in the bay every day and fish and all that. So Safety Harbor was a really nice small town to grow up in. But in the 70s, so 60s and 70s, it started getting kind of rough. And Heritage Village had this picture, and it's not a special picture except that to me it really represents some of the tough times. I think this was our historical society and it was boarded up because they had to close it. But it was a tough time. Some people called Safety Harbor Whiskey Harbor and that could have even been before this time. Um, I spoke to an arborist who was helping with the Baranoff Oak and he said it was a rough and tumble town and um, I, I believe that was true. There were a lot of good old boys, a lot of pickup trucks, and but if you lived in Safety Harbor, you were fine. You were safe, no matter where you lived, and no matter who you were, you were safe. Unless you know, you got in a rumble with your neighbor. But they protected each other, from what I've heard. Um, but people from outside of Safety Harbor, I've heard people say, "Oh, Safety Harbor, that was a scary place to go." So. This is our Baranoff Oak that I was telling you about. It's um, <clears throat> right in front of our library. Salem Baranoff, I was talking about earlier, he um, donated money for our first library and the property where our library is now. And he purchased the um, American Legion building for a dollar and gave it to something like that. I, I, he was a very generous man who really helped Safety Harbor to flourish. And this tree was, of course, named for him for that reason. This is the Whimsy House. <laughs> if you haven't been to, to it, you, you should go. I'm just just uh, for a little day trip, it's um, the Bowling Ball House. Um, they have also created uh, an art and music center in downtown Safety Harbor. Um, there's so much to do in non-COVID times. We have a festival every April, except not now, Chalk Fest. Has anyone been to Chalk Fest? Okay. Bobby here, she's the, sorry to point you out, but it's my favorite festival of the year. We have so many festivals that really, it took years and years for volunteers to create the city that we have now. Um, and I know that Safety Harbor and Clearwater had very close ties. They helped each other out when they could. Um, Safety Harbor was mad at Clearwater in 1917 when they didn't let us use their fire truck. Well, but, you know, they, they couldn't. What if there was a fire in Clearwater? Can you imagine having one fire truck for this whole area? So I have to tell you a couple really neat things that have happened since we wrote the book. Um, Warren, my co-author, who now lives in Decatur, Georgia, um, we were writing and he said, uh, I need to describe Pinellas County because he said that when he goes to different towns and looks for books, he'll bring them home and then maybe years later say, what state was that in? Where was this little town that I visited and bought a history book from? So he wanted to put in the beginning that Safety Harbor, Florida, you know, is on the edge of Pinellas County and he wanted to describe it, so he came up with, it um, hangs down off, the, off Pinellas County like a crooked thumb. <laughs> well, there's now a brewery, and, and it's called Crooked Thumb, and if, we're just kind of proud of that. So <laughs> they came to us and said, we love that line, can we use it? 
Um, the other thing is that I got to write some uh, history for our Safety Harbor walking tour. Does Clearwater have a Florida Humanities uh, walking tour yet? Not yet. We're working on it right Oh, now. good, good. Yeah, they're wonderful. And um, so come to Safety Harbor. It's free. You have to download the app. Uh, Tarpon Springs has one. A lot of, it's called Florida Stories. Um, and it's, like I said, it's free and it will take you throughout your tour. The other really amazing thing, and this is what I am most proud of, is that, and it's not necessarily from the book, it's just that some awareness was brought out from the book, is I get to be on the board for the Whispering Souls African American Cemetery. Um, Jacqueline here is our president, and I just, I feel like out of everything that's happened lately as far as history goes, we're doing some things right, uh, all of us in, in Pinellas County, and that is, um, when I first saw the cemetery to write about it, um, the weeds were about this high, and um, I thought it had been forgotten, but it hadn't. It's just that we didn't have Jacqueline in town yet, so. Anyway, that, um, those are some, some positive things that have happened because of history, that, and one's just kind of for fun, but. Um, let's see, let me go to, I didn't oh. know about the crooked pill. You didn't, yeah. So, here we go. We have, that's Old Safety Harbor, Main Street, right around the turn of the century. And that's our current Safety Harbor. 